Welcome to K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young and Drew Galloway. And as you can see, by me saying that there are three people here, there are indeed three people here. We're all ready to go on this Monday, where it's a pretty good Monday if you're a K-Stater. Right now, the Batcats are headed to the Super Regionals after a 3-0 and weekend down in Fayetteville. D.Y. is playfully trolling the uh, the Hogs. Shout out the Hogs. Woo. The most annoying and dumb thing in college yes. sports. That's yeah. I'm, my my dad called me last night. We were talking. And he said, "You know, after that was like, he's like, that's the most consistent Arkansas athletic event that I've ever seen. Like start to finish. He's like, I always thought that there was maybe more to the calling of the Hogs. He's like, nope, there wasn't. It's just that. Uh, and I was like, yeah, it's just really annoying and stupid. And as we found out, uh, annoying and stupid is also a good way to describe." Arkansas fans on Twitter. So that's uh, that's how that went. K-State off to uh, Charlottesville. They'll face Virginia later on this week in the best of three Super Regional. And uh, it's like, Drew, I'll, I'll talk to you about this real quick because we discussed this last week, but we said, hey, we could be, uh, we could be talking about an 0-2 K-State team on Monday, or we could talk about them, you know, having a chance to go to the Super Regional Little did we know that they wouldn't need that Monday game to even be played to have that chance. They just take care of business on Sunday. Thanks. To yeah, Sunday. it's like uh, we kind of talked about how their ceiling is really high, but their floor was just really low. And I think that we kind of saw that case. It probably built more for tournament play than regular season because you can throw your eyes however long that you want. Tyson Neighbors getting a 10 out save and just kind of you get to see the stars really shine. I think that's been fun to see so far in this tournament. Might, might've got a third starting pitcher too. Yeah. yeah. Ty rule coming back from the dead was fun to see. Yeah. That was a, uh, it was a, that's one of those where if it was like the NBA or the NFL, they'd be like, well, you know, like the best trade deadline pickup was getting this guy back from injury. Uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that K State got with Ty Rule, who was really good. And I, I mean, you, I think immediately you could tell him be encouraged because of how he was missing bats uh, yesterday. So K State on to the Supers. We'll talk a little bit about that later on in the week. But we are here today to talk a little K State football. We are getting closer to the start of the football season. We are just over a month away from Big 12 Media Days. So it will start to feel like real football soon. Uh, official visits over the weekend, more camps. Drew will have more on that with our recruiting update during the week here on the YouTube. But also, you can head to casetownline.com and get updates on guys that just got offers, guys that visited, whatever you need in that space. But we're going to talk about the specific team that's in front of us for this upcoming season and what the best and worst case scenarios are for K-State football. So if everything goes the best way that it can, in a realistic manner, like I want it to be phrased that way, because obviously I, we could all tell each other what the best and worst case scenario for every football team is. You win every game or you lose every game. But the idea here is to be a little bit more serious about it and, and kind of paint, paint the circumstances that would go that way. And I would almost – we'll talk about it as we get a little bit deeper into it, but I think when we talk about worst case scenarios – there should be one that's reserved for, hey, this is what it looks like if, you know, for some unforeseen reason, Avery Johnson is not available versus, hey, Avery stayed healthy. Everything went according to plan, but this just went awry. I think that that's a very unique path uh, to, to discuss. So that's where we will go with everything. But in general, I'll ask D.Y. this first. If you had to have a list of possible outcomes for the K-State season, and I'm treating you like a computer that has its own little algorithm it's going to spit out. Are the outcomes in your computer more positive or negative? Say you get you say, hey, I, I simulated a thousand seasons and X amount are positive, X amount are negative. How many would you throw in the positive category? I think the bulk would be positive. I, I think th there's probably a few scenarios where you get to as low as seven wins, but probably not many of those. Um, and probably a little bit more at eight. A good chunk is probably in the nine, 10, and perhaps 11 range for wins. And then, again, uh, just like a few at seven, a few probably at undefeated. Because I, 
if we're being realistic, I, I do think it is still with because uh, I think it's within the realm of possibility. You don't have to stretch too far to say that they're going. They could go twelve and zero because, as we've seen with some of the books, I don't think the books would say Kansas State's going to go twelve and zero. But I think the books might have them as a favorite in every single game they play. Yeah, I, I think that I I would definitely agree that more definitely positive because I think that this is probably the deepest team that K-State's had in a, in a long time and a lot of high-end talent, a lot of high-end talent that was pretty young. So that's why you probably have some scenarios where there's probably seven wins. But I, I think that the majority are probably in that 9, 10, 11 with a few in that 12 range where if everything goes right and the younger players can really step up and there's no real growing pains, like 11, 12 wins is definitely in the realm of possibility. Yeah. I, I think if you're, you're going through and you, 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 your, you know, your simulation as a computer is not factoring in any injuries. I think there's very few that would come back and say, you have anything less than, six wins and even more like I think you'd even say very few have less than seven just because this team has far too much talent and production in other areas that will be around that it's just it's hard to envision that not happening because you know you, you should have two games you win without any circumstance uh, in the non-conference and then you play enough teams in conference play even like we know Cincinnati and Arizona State are going to be disgusting um, and that's just to name a few. And then you have some others in there that you don't really know what to expect, but you're not thinking that they're of the same caliber of what K-State has. So uh, let's let's start with the the good because everybody loves saving the bad for last, and uh, we'll, we'll rope everybody in with the good. So, Drew, paint your best-case scenario for K-State football in terms of how the, the record ends up and how they're able to get to that point because – a big part of the best case scenarios in this is, hey, breaks fall K State's way. It doesn't fall the way of Team X or Team Y over here. I think that best case scenario is probably like in that eleven and one range where you really get to see Avery Johnson shine and he's as advertised. You get to see some flashes from younger players like Jordan Allen, Chidi Obiyes, or Trace Spivey takes a jump, like Jace Brown takes another jump. And you really get to see kind of the younger talent be showcased and kind of put together a run for the next season. So in this 11 and one best case scenario, I'd say it's 11 and one, you get to Arlington, you win, and then potentially win a game in the playoff. And then that's probably your best case scenario where everything is kind of lined up. You see the future because the offense looks bright and Connor Riley has no real hangups as a first time play caller uh, for a full season. And you really get to see, how the defense comes together and the younger defensive line really shines and the corners play well and the safeties play well and everything just kind of comes together for the, this perfect storm and you stay relatively healthy. I think that 11 and one at a big 12 championship and winning a game in the playoff is a pretty realistic scenario for best case. Yeah, I'm there. I mean, technically, the perfect storm has you 12-0 and because, like I said, you might be favored in every single game you play. But I am going to account for having a first-time play caller and having a lot of these guys that they're going to rely heavily on. It's going to be their first real year of heavy contribution from start to finish. So I do think you need that one-game buffer in there. So 11-1 and makes sense in that world. So I can see that logic, and that's probably the logic that makes the most sense. In terms of, and obviously that would include winning in Arlington. In terms of a playoff game, man, it just, it's largely dependent on, I mean, assuming they go 11-1 and win the Big 12, I, I'm going to assume the ACC champ is still the three seed in that scenario, and K-State would be the four. I mean, there, there's very possible you're going to play a five seed, and that could be still in Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State, and I, I don't know that that's realistic. I, I don't. I, I think we have to wait and see who that first playoff game is. Yeah that that seems that seems fair. I here's what all a little side side question here for both of you because 
Uh, I think D.Y. pointing out first-year play caller is significant and important, and there will be that slip-up. I mean, we saw guys that were veterans at it, like Courtney Messingham and guys that we thought were really good at it, Colin Klein, have their struggles at, at points uh, and then look you know, unstoppable for the next three weeks. Uh, if you had to pick a game where that kind of rears its ugly head, which game do you think it would be on the K-State season? Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to pull it up because yeah. it happens typically in sort of trap games and, and maybe on the road or against a really good defensive mind. The thing is, is like their road games are not that daunting. If you want me to phrase it in a more fun way, uh, which game does KSO have the most threads about firing the offensive coordinator after it? Yeah, it's tough to find on the schedule because a lot of the games you'd rather have at home, you're getting at home. You get Oklahoma State, Arizona, and Kansas at home. So that's ideal. But, again, I, Kansas doesn't have a good defense anyway. So, you know, what is it to it? Uh, I worry a little bit about the pokes because they just seem to kind of have K-State's number. But the last time K-State played Oklahoma State at home, they won 48-0. to So I don't know that that's – you know, going to Tulane in week two, maybe that might be one. Yeah. I mean, that's that's your first test. Yeah, the the ones that really kind of pop out to me are Tulane because it's the first road game, and they're going to be pretty jacked up to play a power four school at home, eleven a.m. It's going to be going to be very humid. Iowa State makes a lot of sense, uh, but Houston was another one that kind of jumped out to me because it's sandwiched between you play. At home against KU the week before, and then you get the second bye week right after. And that's kind of a tricky spot. And the last time that K-State played Willie Fritz, I mean, we, we know that the offense didn't play well. And so I think that that's kind of the the one that really is kind of the under-the-radar one, probably. Terrible so I, weather I, game. It was a terrible yeah. weather game. Yeah. Yes. But I, I think I would lean towards Houston, maybe. So just look up in your farmer's almanac, Mason, and and find that day that it's going to be really bad weather-wise. The last time I saw farmer's almanac, I was in the K-Man News Studio, and there was always one in there for some reason. And uh, I don't know that I ever opened it because I was just like, "What is this? You know, old-timey sorcery that's in front of me." I had no uh, no intentions of looking into it. I I honestly, I it's interesting to me that you guys think like Houston in there. I kind of think uh, that if we were going to pick one and it seemed like it was catastrophic uh, in, in what the result ended up being, either the road game at BYU or the road game at West Virginia seems like the two that I would target. So that BYU one will be your first conference, your first real conference game of the year, the first one that counts, first road conference game, and then the West Virginia one, weird trip, that the K-State and West Virginia outside of, you know, the last handful of years where K-State's just kind of taking care of business. Uh, that's just been a really strange game that's been played um, with uh, the results. So I think that those would be the two that I would throw out there. I, the Houston one wouldn't worry me as much because I think when you get to that stretch of the season after the KU game, you got four left. You'll be motivated to finish things off well. And by November, I, I don't know how many – with what's left there, it's not like they're going to be looking ahead to any of those games. Like, can you really play a trap game in November when all you have to do is just not lose to a terrible team? You, yeah. you can when you play your rival the week before and you have a bye week right after. Yeah. Could be a let. I mean, it's a letdown spot. And Willie Fritz is a good coach. It, it is his first year. I, that one, for some reason, doesn't – doesn't scare me. BYU doesn't scare me. They, I just don't respect BYU enough on the field to really threaten. West Virginia is potential, but again, I've said it all off season. I think there's going to be a lot of regression there this year for West Virginia. Iowa State because makes a lot of sense because of where it's at. That that has the potential to be a weather game, right? Although the weather didn't stop anyone last year, but that game in Ames also the potential implications of it. I mean, teams can sometimes play tight when there's those kinds of implications. I don't know if it's going to have any implications for Iowa State, but it certainly could for K-State. Yeah, I guess my only thought would be with the, the Iowa State game, like 
by that point in the season, I, I think I, I it would be just like a bad game. I don't know that we would chalk it up to being like inexperienced or like still trying to find kind of your legs and everything. Uh, like you know, like Colin Klein in in twenty twenty two, that game against uh, against Tulane was just not good in, in any way. Now, some of that is on Colin. I think also some of that, a lot of it, I would put more of the blame on Adrian Martinez at that point. Uh, still probably was needing to just have a little bit more confidence in himself, but right. he got it, he got it kind yeah. of figured out, uh, obviously, those, after that. Those things were about the intangibles, but their dud last year had nothing to do with intangibles. They just – sometimes yeah. you can lay an egg. Look, look, last year was Stillwater, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that and the one in Stillwater, you could tell early that it was just not going to go well. No. And then – that from an offensive standpoint, Stillwater last year. From a defensive standpoint, Iowa State in the blizzard. Yeah, yep. No, that that all that all adds up. So we we talk about the the best case scenario. In my eyes, I I'm with you, Dy. Like it's it isn't unrealistic to and be crazy to say that K State could win all of those games. Like they should beat UT Martin. We should we that's not even worth talking about. They should beat Tulane. A lot of changes made down there. Uh, and you have like, if you're Chris Kleiman, you have the easy motivation to be like, we lost to these guys two years ago. Now, half of the guys are more in the locker room. We're not there, but like, I think you can still use that message to get it across. Like it, it, that, that, that should not happen. Yeah. Um, that I probably will still be nervous for that game. I'm not gonna lie. That's fair. I, I don't, I don't know that people shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, a real I, group of group of five thing with this program for some reason. That is true. It's that's a it's a scary world out there uh, when the group of five is is involved for some reason. But I think outside of that, like I I expect you know the the Arizona game will be maybe tricky for them. But there's also a world where like Arizona may not end up being anything special this year just because of the coaching changes. That's um, and you go right. through everything else, and and you know, KU is KU and Iowa State and Oklahoma State. Those are the the real toughies on the schedule after that point. And you know, maybe the, since it's a road game at Iowa State, Iowa State's like a one and a half point favorite or something. But K State probably should be favored in all of these other games that they're playing. And if everything went according to plan, they could do it. But I, I would tend to side with you guys. The combination of First year quarterback, first year play caller. There's probably just going to be a game where you could also combine something else wonky happening, whether it's some insane performance on the other side or bad weather, whatever Injury. contributes to probably a loss. Yeah. So 11 and one probably makes the most sense there. And I do think, like, if we're talking about exterior best case scenarios for K State, it would be that one of those teams that could pop something off has a guy that, hey, he's dinged up. He can't go this week. Like, you know, K State in in twenty twenty two, they played a top ten Oklahoma State team, but they were really battered going into that game, and so there were a lot of guys that you, you either heard weren't going to play, or they were game time decisions and whatever else. K State was obviously able to take advantage of that. That would be the kind of thing this year where you'd be like, yeah, if you if you wanted the season to get lighter on you in terms of what was required, that game against Oklahoma State, you're like, well, Ollie Gordon got dinged up the week before and he's got to miss a week or two. Like that would be the type of thing that would happen. Or Gee, you have yeah. you have quarterbacks that like regress to what they should be, you know, like Alan Bowman and and Garrett Green. So that that's what I would throw out there. But in, in the moment, those were a lot tougher to project than the stuff that just pertains to K State. Ollie Gordon, Oklahoma State, like if something happened there, Jalen Daniels, KU, you know. Fafita, Arizona. I, I, maybe I'm crazy, but I'm starting to think the more and more I think, the discuss, think, ponder about that game. I'm not like I could see K State pulling away. They're the Arizona pulling, game. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. They're becoming less scary to me as time goes on. Okay, well, you're not you're not a believer in in Brent Brennan, I guess. So we'll mark that. Yeah, I down. think that, I, I think that's a lot like a large part of it. They're going to a new yeah. conference. It's a big road game in week three on a weird night, right? It happened to K State when they went to Stillwater, and is that core going to be just as good for Brent Brennan as it was Jed Fish? I don't, it seems like those. 
are those two styles similar? I don't know. I'd have to look into that more. And I know Brent Brennan won at a place that everyone says is near impossible to win at at San Jose State, but I just I was never wowed. Yeah, no, that's fair. All right, uh, let's get negative here. Uh, my favorite part of the show, as most people are aware of. D.Y., paint your worst-case scenario for K-State football in 2024. Again, realistically, not you know something crazy goes down and it's like, yeah, the, this, this, and this, and this, and this, they're, they're two and ten. Like, we know, yes, they could lose every game. It's possible it, it will not happen. Uh, so paint your worst-case scenario if everything remains normal health-wise at quarterback because that's the greatest caveat in all of these for any team. The yeah, other stuff definitely. you could say – Hey, depth catches up at corner or wherever else, but paint your worst case scenario if Avery Johnson plays all 12 games. What I will say is I, I will adhere to those guidelines, but an injury to Avery Johnson or a starting quarterback in general for, might affect K-State a little bit more than others. Now, maybe Taquan Roberson, the addition from the UConn transfer, lightens that up, but until that point, it was looking pretty meager. Um in terms of death wise at the position. Yeah, uh, I would say it's just for some reason the the pieces just don't come together offensively under Connor Riley. That would be maybe your worst case scenario because at least you you still have a defense there that I think is going to be pretty good. They've had like top three, top four in the league under every year under Joe Klanerman. But the offensive line, like a really slow start. Connor Riley is still trying to figure out what the package, what he wants it to look like, um, just the inexperience in general. And in my opinion, so I guess I'm talking through this too, right? So I'm saying a very slow start due to the inexperience um, gets them caught in a few games. Like I could see them finishing well, but I could see like because of the inexperience, both the play calling and at certain important positions on the field, Maybe you get stung by Arizona and Oklahoma State and you start four and two. Yeah, I think that worst case scenario is kind of a lot harder to frame in that realistic mind because I, I just think that there's so much talent and it feels like they're pretty deep at most positions that you don't feel super bad I would, about anything. Yeah. I would say I'll just put it this way because I didn't really, I guess, dive into it full scale. In terms of a floor with Avery Johnson staying healthy, in terms of a floor of wins, it should be seven. If if you did anything less than that, then it was a complete disaster. No, I think some people would say seven is kind of a disaster if Avery Johnson stays healthy. It would feel like a disaster. I, I mean, you could probably be. Mr. Hey, have some perspective guy, but nobody would care for that. And, and, no, I, no, and I no, probably no. wouldn't care for it either. I'm like, eh, it probably, probably was a little bit of a failure. Yeah. It, it might, it probably still should be qualified as a, a failure depending on how you got there, but seven or eight wins is probably the floor. And you probably feel unsatisfied when you do that, but that's probably the floor. Yeah. The, the floor, I think just with, how this team is constructed with Avery Johnson staying healthy and just the floor that we've seen with Chris Kleiman is probably eight wins. And it has something to do with maybe not all the pieces coming together, right? First time play caller, first time starting quarterback. There could be just something wonky a little bit there, but I mean, we've seen every year under Chris Kleiman, K-State's won at least eight games. So it's hard for me to think that anything but less than eight, eight could happen. Yeah, besides the COVID year, it's been pretty consistent in that. What I what I would say is, like, even if you do win only seven or eight games, you're probably kind of pissed about it considering the expectations and what you thought you were capable of. But the good thing about that is you could still convince yourself the following year is going to be, like, 10 or 11 wins still. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Drew, and then I'll hop in. I was going to say like eight wins, like you could convince yourself that there was so much young talent on the team that if you keep it together, you could go 10, 10 and two, 11 and one pretty easily the following year. But yeah, this we, is probably the year to do it because of how the schedule lined up. Which I, K-State fans have done it in the past. I think uh, for some reason we were all like convinced after uh, that 2017 was going to be like a really, really good year. 
Uh, I know that I was for whatever reason. I I, I don't know. Happened. <laughs> I don't know which yeah. game it was, but I just remember I told I just told people I was like, ah, yeah. I walked out of the stands like, man, they're going to be really good next year. And then they were pretty whatever. Uh, that then season. Vanderbilt happened. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Vander Vander. I mean, Vanderbilt's enough to just train wreck an entire season. Uh, and really, Vanderbilt was probably the the true beginning of the end for everybody. Uh, I would I would paint this in terms of worst case scenario uh, with everybody staying healthy. You get into the situation and you realize that none of the guys at receiver make the jumps that you kind of anticipate or want. Like you would say, okay, Jace Brown. People know now they're not unsuspecting of the true freshman making plays for you. Keegan Johnson can never get on the field and stay healthy. It just he he doesn't do anything splashy. Dante Cephas is a dud, and that yeah he he wasn't able to make that jump from Kent State to Power Four football because he struggled at Penn State, and then if it didn't go well at K State, then the new play calling aspect of it, you know, Connor Riley, great offensive line coach, just not cut out to call the plays. The, the Matt Wells dynamic, two guys jockeying back and forth in that room. And then you look around defensively and all these times that we've talked about, well, you know, that we don't know the specific names in some of these places, but we think there are guys that make it all come together. Um, you may just end up with a pretty average to slightly below average defense. I think those are the things that would contribute to a season that put you in a tough spot. I think the benefit is that, like you guys talked about, seven wins, it's tough to see anything below that. I think that's because of the talent of Avery Johnson. And even if he had like a normal, really young quarterback first season type of year where it's a lot of highs, a lot of lows, big mistakes, big plays, you're probably going to win out more with the big plays and still be able to get a handful of games. So I think I do think the floor would probably be seven wins in just an absolute worst case scenario. I think realistically though, eight and four is, is the floor. And if you get to seven and five, anything worse than that or at that is, is a failure this upcoming season. That's a lot of pressure. And that's a lot of maybe unfair to some extent expectations because of the guys that are going to be having to shoulder that load. But um, you, you have a lot of talent. This league seems ripe for the taking and it's really K-State and Utah have the best bases in it, and, and Oklahoma State, I'll throw them in there, in terms of what you're trying to build your success on this season. And the schedule's forgiving. I know Drew touched on it too, but you wish you had this schedule next year almost, right? That's what yeah. I would say. Yeah. Because you get, you get all three of Oklahoma State, Arizona, and Kansas at home, and you don't have to play Utah. It's pretty good. Yeah. That, well, you that's you why, make out that's pretty why. well. That, that's why I think that seven and five is probably the one that's really hard to swallow. Like eight and four, you can probably talk yourself into it, but seven and five with how forgiving the schedule is, I think. I would t- I, would the only reason why I, I, I mentioned seven and five and kind of put it on the table is I think you could realistically, I think you could still lose the Tulane. Yeah. It, it like I think that that's probably the one where. You lose, they to, got you, can, you can lose to Tulane. Yeah, you can lose to Tulane, Arizona, Oklahoma State, KU, and Iowa State. All right, so let, then let's let's do this real quick, and I'll, I'll get each of your guys's opinion on it. Well, before we do this, I we better we better pay off the if we do worst case scenario, considering we know what the worst case scenario is, and that's that Avery Johnson can't play for a large chunk of the season. What do you think this team would look like if they had to go? Whoever ends up being the backup, we assume that it will be uh, Ta- Taquan Roberson. What what does that entail? Do the pieces around him, like DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards, is that enough to carry above enough veterans on defense to kind of piece it together? We know, obviously, Chris Kleiman and Joe Klanderman are really good coaches. Like, what does that look like in your guys' eyes? That's that might be a little bit. Might be sick for people to be interested in hearing about, but I know that there would be people that would be interested in it. I mean, that's asking us to know a lot about Taquan Roberson, and I can't say I've watched a lot of UConn football, but I am pretty sure you picked them in best bets last year at one point, though, and probably, uh, it did not work out. Probably, I but yeah, I think you're right. I would say that I think they would 
figure out a way to claw for a bowl game. Yeah, I would agree. Like six and six, seven and five. I think that the defense could carry a backup quarterback to at least making a bowl game. I think that's I think that's encouraging for people to hear because uh, I, I I'm, I'm I'm with you. I mean, I think five and seven would be where it goes, but I just I don't think that the option wouldn't be so bad at quarterback where that happens. And I mean, think about all the other seasons where we've seen bad quarterback play at K State in a normal year, not when, you know, global pandemic we hadn't seen for a century, but like Joe Hubner went six and six at K State with far less talent around him, you know? Yeah. So I, yeah, no, Again, I think they, to I, Joe Hubner for <laughs> the, you know, the shot. I, I think there's a scenario where the wheels wouldn't completely come up, yeah. but had they not landed Roberson, who's actually played some college football before, then I am probably much more skeptical. That's that's fair. I think that's fair. Uh, trying to think if there's any other like good, notable, hey, th- if this happens, mail it in type scenarios. But I, re- I really don't know that there is. I think there's en- enough just talent makeup in a lot of areas to where – uh, you can sustain some guys missing time or whatever for the most part. The only concern would be at quarterback, like we've been talking about. So uh, yeah. we can we can call it there, unless either of you have something else in that, and then we can kind of dive into what I want to do with the schedule real quick. Uh, offensive coordinator, you know, like Connor Riley has to he has to have it. I'm not saying he doesn't, but he has to have it. Okay. I thought I wasn't sure if you you're just ch- challenging Connor Riley right now. Is that what you're doing? Just hey, bring it, bring it, yeah. Connor. Like he can't be completely. And not, I'm not. Tr- I'm trying not to do it as a making it sound bad. He can't be completely incompetent. Like we've seen some teams before go make an offensive coordinator hire, and it's just a complete fiasco. Like it's a horrible decision. I think we saw it last year, right when Arkansas hired Bobby Petrino. Yeah, no, nope. yeah. that's a good point. That's fair. Uh, I think, and I think people would would be on board with that and agree. Okay, so here's what I want to do with the schedule because I assume both of you have it in front of you. We talked about Dy specifically is nervous about the two lane game still. He he will not just pencil that one in. No, nope. you can use whatever logic you want to, but going through how many games would you throw in what I like to call the toss up category where. Mm-hmm. You go into it and you say, all right, Tulane, for this reason, I can't just give this to K-State like that. That's that's a toss-up going in there. I could see anything happening. Uh, obviously, like Oklahoma State at home would seem to profile as that or on the road at Iowa State. So how many of those games and which ones do you guys see? For me, it's five, and that's why I mentioned seven and five. Now, I – Usually, uh, you're not going to go 0 and 5 in those games, so that's why their floor is probably more than seven wins, as you guys have pointed out. But it's Tulane, Arizona, Oklahoma State, Kansas, and Iowa State. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that that's just the, I think that's the correct answer. Like all of those games, you could see K State potentially losing for various reasons. Tulane being on the road against a G5 school yeah, that's already beat them before. Arizona just. I know that with the new staff coming in, that they're kind of more of an unknown, but that's definitely a losable game. Oklahoma State's had K-State's number before. At some point, KU probably is going to beat K-State. At, I haven't seen it in a while, but you know, eventually it's going to happen, you'd think. And then Iowa State, just a tricky spot because, because of weather. It's on the road. It's the last game. Teams play tight when it's the last game. They have a lot on the line. So I, I just think that that's probably just the correct answer is that there's five. I know you don't want to put Tulane in it, and and that's totally cool. Uh, I wouldn't put Tulane in it if they were playing in week 10. I think week yeah. two kind of makes it different. Week two so, makes it a lot scarier. So you're saying that Chris Kleiman should get – them on the schedule late in the year in the future like north texas back in uh what we talk about all the time drew was that like oh seven no that was it was later i guess it was was it oh eight oh nine well now now i can't remember we we used to have it pegged because we talked about it a lot we talked about that game they also 
they went to Fresno State late in the year. Uh, yeah, I remember that too. Around that same time too. I think that might have been like 07, 08. Because I think Prince coached that team. I don't know. I, I gotta was, go, at, I gotta I was go at that North Texas game and I couldn't tell you when I was. Yeah, we, we what we talked about was Lance Dunbar. Was that the who we did? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Lance, Lance Dunbar had like a million yards for North Texas I, in that game. I feel like that had to have been like 09, maybe. Because I, I, for whatever reason, I feel like, I don't know. Maybe not. I'm I'm go I'm going to confirm right now to see when that was because I remember it was 2010. I, I was gonna say I'm pretty yeah. sure that Snyder was the coach when that happened, but 2010, so the pinstripe bowl year. And then let's see, so 08. No, that was not it for uh, the, the Fresno game. And then uh, 07, they ended on the road at Fresno State, 45 to 29 loss to end your season to Fresno State. So. Uh, By the way, are you? Did you look at the the North Texas box score when when you clicked on it? Because no, I was just going to see when it when it was played. So K, K- State had seventy seven passing yards and put up forty nine points. Uh, um, that chalk that adds up. You want to hear the uh, Ron Prince horror story? Two thousand seven. This is how the season ended: thirty one to twenty loss at Iowa State, seventy three to thirty one loss at Nebraska, forty nine to thirty two home loss to Missouri. And then a forty-five to twenty-nine road loss at Fresno State uh, to finish just, the season five and seven. Did the defense just not make those games? Did it just not show up? <laughs> like, they're averaging like giving up fifty a game. That's that Nebraska game was hoof. Uh, was that Lance, oh, was that the Taylor Martinez thing? No, that was no. that was two thousand ten uh, Nebraska yeah. in Manhattan. Not the, great. That Nebraska game was on Versus, which I had to search to find on my TV for forever, and then finally found it, and the game was never competitive. Which? Uh, Lance, go ahead. Lance Dunbar had 270 yeah. yards in that North Texas game, and Daniel Thomas had 269. Which, what's funny, if you go back and, and look at it, you could have told yourself after the, after the Baylor game that K-State played that year in 2007 uh, that, like, hey, you know, it's it's not been great, like, cl- but close losses to KU, Oklahoma State, whatever. Like, they could piece something together here, and then just the wheels uh, just an off. awful finish, which is on you know makes sense for for Ron Prince. Uh, real quick before we get out of here, I'll tell you this. Yeah, I'm not worried about Tulane. You're not going to trick me, Dy. I'm not going to buy into it. But I would throw Arizona into that category. I would throw Oklahoma State. KU and Iowa State in there. So I would I would go with four. I would say those four if we're getting the best version of K-State this upcoming season. I think I think I'm just mentally hurt, injured still from Arkansas State, Navy, Tulane. Um, am I missing one? I don't uh, I think that it's it's probably fair to have both non-conference games in there too because I, I don't think Chris Kleiman's gone three and zero in the non-con first year, right? Year one, that was the only yeah. one. Year one is the only one. Yeah, see, beat, beat uh beat uh was it Nichols? Then yeah, blasted Nichols. Then beat Mississippi State thanks to Malik Knowles and Starkville, I believe, and then was it Troy? No, oh, no, I think it was Bowling Green who was awful. Oh, yeah. yeah, Bowling Green. Bowling Green was bad. We, I like think that, we, got, that we got a Bowling Green fan in the background. I think <laughs> that she's Bowling driving Green me nuts. Thing. It's it's time it's time to get out of here so I can shove a bottle in her mouth and uh, hope that she falls asleep. So that'll do it for the KSO show today. We'll be back tomorrow for Derek Young, Drew Galloway. I'm Mason Voth, and Elliot Voth needs to just take a chill pill. <laughs>